uh, thank you, Professor Ashok. I think Dr. Ujbal, I think, is, has already joined with us. You have already given a nice introduction for him. And uh, as per the uh, talk from Dr. Giani, we can very well understand the future is going to be uh, with the innovation that to be that to be bundled with technology, technology with innovation that is going to be the future for healthcare. So we have the right speaker for the day. Dr. Ujwal Rao is with us. Let me invite Dr. Ujwal Rao to address the gathering. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, KK. Uh, can you hear me, KK? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, are you able to see my screen as well? Yes, please. Okay. Slides you can share. Yeah. Put it in the slide. Yes, there. fine. Fine. Okay, brilliant. So uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, of, of MedCon and uh, uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar in particular for uh, inviting me to this uh, event. And I, I must say, I'm like really glad uh, that I could share the stage again with uh, Dr. Girdar Gyani after quite a while. And I was just, uh, before we started the discussion, I was uh, uh, referring to Dr. Gyani about a discussion we had, I think about five, five years back and we met in Vietnam during a conference and uh, Gyani ji was mentioning to me the importance of adult vaccination and how you know, that is something that India has not really taken on. And uh, that's, that's, I think, uh, you know, it was in some sense very prescient because uh, now that we see all of our adults getting vaccinated with uh, uh, COVID uh, vaccines, <clears throat> I think it's a, it's a learning lesson in, in some sense. And uh, I think over a period of time, this will, post COVID is gonna accelerate the whole adult vaccination program. Incidentally, yesterday, uh, uh, a paper uh, that uh, Dr. Vishal Rao, a good friend of mine from the Dean of HCG Academic Center and uh, a team that we have there, we published a paper on the, uh, the use of oral polio vaccines in, uh, in COVID. And we did a review of literature on that and how it actually activates uh, uh, you know, the, the innate immunity. And we are now discussing ways to kind of use that for the pediatric population. And, and we are working out uh, you know, the review of literature for that. But essentially, the idea that adults also need to be vaccinated is something that Dr. Gani actually thought about, you know, years ahead. And in some sense, and he's been a mentor for me uh, right during my quality days before I was completing my PhD. And uh, Dr. Gani ji has, uh, you know, kind of instilled that sense of uh, uh, quality. And at the same time, the the candor that, that he spoke with, I think it's it's refreshing to see that People are not marking their words and are quite, uh, you know, open and honest about how we fared with this. So I think uh, we've got a good sense of how the, you know, the existing state is. And I think uh, for, for me, I think the job is to actually set out what the future holds. And in terms of what we call human-centered artificial intelligence. And if you speak to an AI purist, he'll tell you a different definition of human-centered, which I'll obviously cover in my presentation. But to me, the idea of centered and human is, is more in terms of, uh, I've taken the definition of patient centricity to the next level and talked about human centered technology. So that would be something that would be, you know, the key uh, theme for me in terms of how can we make technology, uh, you know, help us get back those elements of compassion and, you know, the, the element of empathy with patients, uh, which we, you know, tend to kind of forget during the regular course of uh, our day. And uh, I'm, I'm actually reminded of my medical uh, school days. And I don't know how many of you have uh, actually seen uh, uh, Patch Adams. I wonder if you remember this movie called Patch Adams. And I'm just going to play a, Here we have a little clip for you. Here diabetic with poor circulation and diabetic neuropathy. As you can see, these are diabetic ulcers with lymphedema and evidence of gangrene. Questions? Any osteomyelitis? None apparent although not definitive. Treatment? To stabilize the blood sugar. Consider antibiotics, possibly amputation. What's her name? I was just wondering the patient's name. 
Marjorie. Hi, Marjorie. Hi. Yes, uh, thank you. Let's move on. Let's move on indeed. So, uh, as you notice, uh, the doctors on rounds, uh, they're so busy getting information in terms of, you know, the complications, what the patient could have. And as you can see, the idea of the patient getting an amputation and, you know, elements that you speak to, uh, you know, other colleagues, but in front of the patient, the idea is that the patient's just an object while you're actually looking at, uh, you know, the whole idea of uh, treatment and prevention. And uh, you have, uh, you know, Patch Adams played by Robin Williams, one of my favorite actors, who comes and asks a simple question what the patient's name is, right? So many times you forget that uh, the, the whole idea of personalizing care, which is such a critical aspect of the whole care process, uh, we seem to have lost that. And, and you know, uh, from Dr. Gyani's uh, talk as well, you could, you could imagine why doctors, uh, you know, it's not something that we do as as uh, you know as something that is is part of the process per se but it's just that we're so burdened with the whole idea of uh, the treatment and you know gathering evidence and looking at what works and what doesn't um, we've seen how conflicting evidence there is uh, in terms of remdesivir and uh, you know etolizumab and you know atocilizumab and and you'll hear who chief saying that ivermectin doesn't work there's another you know, group of people say it does work. So in this stage, I mean, our job mostly is to actually start looking at evidence in terms of what works and what doesn't, right? And in the, the whole idea of this burden, we forget that uh, the patient is at the center of it. And I think uh, the, there is a multifactorial uh, kind of genesis to this fact of you know, essentially dehumanizing care. So the question is that how can we rehumanize healthcare? And, does technology have a role to play in that? You know? And that would be uh, a critical aspect to actually address um, more so in terms of cognitive technologies, right? So if you look at some of the figures in, in India, uh, there's one estimate, there's one study uh, there which says that there are about uh, 52 lakh medical errors that occur in India every year. And I know um, Dr. Gyaniji has also spoken to uh, Professor Ashish Jha uh, when he was uh, uh, previously in his in his previous uh, institution, you know, talking about the methodology for the study, but yeah, I mean, there is some sense in coming to this figure of you know an alarming rate of medical errors that that occur in India. And the other part is that how much do we spend on technology? So eight billion is the overall spend on technology in India, right? And and you see the other part of it is the penetration of electronic health records, which is the the, the foundation of, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole automation of the care process itself. Like the first thing you need to have is a record of the patient itself. But you see that the penetration of EHRs itself is so low in India, right? So how do you actually go on from there? The idea then is that with, with the lack of this, uh, lack of EHR penetrations or having um, in the in electronic record or any sort of technology in the part of the care process itself. And I'm not referring to, you know, the operational side of things in terms of uh, hospital management, facility management, and things of that sort. But I'm talking about the core care processes, right? In that, then you're likely to have this scenario. And I, I know several of you are, uh, you know, several of us are guilty of this crime and several of us are also you know, the victims of this crime, you know. So I wonder if anybody can actually guess what this, uh, what this prescription is. So I, I usually during my talks, I would, I would ask people to tell me what it is, but I know that some of you who are pharmacists who, who know how to, you know, read doctors codified uh, handwritings uh, have figured this out that this is Seldenafil, right? And Seldenafil, um, the other part is you, I'd ask you, what is the actual dosage? So some of you might say 125 mg and some of you might say 25 mg, right? So if you've said 25 mg, you know, you get five stars. And if you've said 125 mg, you've actually, you know, kind of uh, had something called a prescription error, you know, where you've not read the handwriting correctly and you've uh, read L as one and that's, uh, that's become 125 mg. Now, uh, doctors would know that giving Seldenafil, uh, an additional 100 milligrams of Seldenafil uh, you know, and Seldenafil, by the way, is Viagra, right? So imagine giving 100 milligrams more uh, 
uh, to a patient. You can imagine what would happen to that patient. But the indication here is, is for pulmonary hypertension and not the reason that Viagra is famous for. So in this case, this was actually a case, but it was uh, you know a near miss, as we would call it in, in quality reporting, right? So this is operational variability in you know, things as simple as handwriting, right? The other part is knowledge variability, where knowledge between two uh, care professionals, doctors, wouldn't be the same. Now, if I illustrate this with, with a simple uh, you know, um, uh, kind of a graphic, right? The, the circle that you see, if you were to consider this, that all of the knowledge that exists in medicine, hypothetically, if it is con contained within the circle, so you'll have a pie of things that you know in terms of what, what uh, knowledge there is in medicine, things you've learned over the years and actually have actually experienced. Uh, and so you know these things for a fact, right? And then there are things that you don't know, right? So you wouldn't know what are the latest tumor markers or say, what is the latest uh, trials going on in, in say, uh, immune modulators in COVID, for example. You've not read up on that, so you don't know. But then, you know, the idea is that there is an element that you have knowledge of what you know, that is, you know what you know, and you know what you don't know, right? So there is this bigger, bigger pie, right, of, of something that is missing. And that part is, my friends, is what we don't know, we don't know, right? There's so much out there, knowledge that is increasing on a daily basis, which we don't know, we don't know, right? And that creates this whole sense of variability between uh, healthcare professionals, which I like to call the knowledge variability. And this variability in knowledge is at the heart of what I call the knowledge dilemma. And if you look at two um, parameters of, of knowledge, the first being the diffusion of knowledge, meaning how long does it take for knowledge to come from theory to practice, meaning bench to bedside, you know? So that on an average takes about 17 years for any clinical trial or any research study to actually start coming into practice at the population level. The second is how long does it take for medical knowledge to double? Meaning that how, how long would you take, uh, say if you were to consider all of knowledge as X, how long will it take for it to go into two X, right? So there was a study that uh, Dr. Peter Denson had done back in 2011 and he made some estimates whereby the knowledge doubling time is about 73 days. I mean, this study was published about 10 years back and he actually, um, kind of, uh, you know, foresaw or predicted that knowledge would double at the rate of 73 days, meaning that uh, this figure, by the way, in 1950 used to be 50 years, and it's 73 days now, meaning that every MBBS student, by the time he reaches internship, will have to go back and start reading again and, you know, continuously loop in that cycle because knowledge is doubling so exponentially. But interestingly, what has happened during COVID, and I was mentioning the amount of papers that get published every day, this rate has now increased to, to 20 days, meaning that by the time, I mean, in Jan 2020 was the first paper that was published by the Lancet about, uh, you know, a strange disease in, in Wuhan. And uh, at that time, from that time to now, the amount of papers that have been published on COVID has doubled every 20 days, actually, which is which is, uh, you know, phenomenal, right? I mean, how do you keep up with this with this knowledge? And, and that, you know, essentially um, is a, an element of what we call the knowledge dilemma. And if you talk about diffusion, and if you, um, you know, look at the, the whole idea of translational research going from bench to bedside to practice. And uh, this, this is another thing that I, you know, I love to speak about in terms of how the um, studies, we call them phase one studies, animal studies, right? You translate animal studies into humans uh, through phase one trials. And then you take this bedside um, idea that you've actually done phase three clinical trials and you like to translate that into practice. One is at a, you know, at a practice-based research level and the next level is at dissemination into, you know, the larger population, which is translation to actual practice, right? And we've seen that this process takes about 17 years well, what has happened with COVID is that the whole idea of diffusion has completely transformed. I mean, it's, it's become so remarkably fast that you see that sometimes it is even 17 hours that you actually have a paper published in the morning and you have, you know, a patient who is not responding to anything, but you, you know, find a ray of hope and we, what we call compassionate off-label use, you might start giving that drug, right? So you've translated uh, research into practice in a matter of hours, and that's what COVID has done. And this is what I like to call 
the translational research practice hyperloop meaning that research is going into practice in the form of a hyperloop and vice versa right so the idea of practice also informing research is what we call real world data so there's two aspects and it's a bit of play on words uh, so the idea of evidence based practice that is randomized control trials and the other part is practice based evidence which is real world data so these two things are coming together big time and covid has actually Uh, accelerated that and i have worked extensively in this area in designing what we call pragmatic trials meaning that you work with traditional randomized control trials but also have an element of practice based evidence and you know combine them together because you possibly can't do a randomized control trial for everything right so that's where i think uh, technology has a big role to play uh, going back to a bit of the idea of diffusion itself and this is a is an excellent book called the healthcare singularity in the age of semantic medicine uh, by dr michael gillum uh, and and he talked about how medical discoveries have come into practice in the last uh, you know 2 uh, 3000 years or so so you know even before in the bce we knew about angina but the time it took uh, to to get into practice and find a treatment for angina was almost 2000 2000 plus years right and then artemisin and it was known that it is an anti malarial it had properties but to actually get into practice it took you know thousands of years and you know you accelerate further to the current age and that little box that you see over here is essentially the last 150 years so we've seen pupil fever for example you may have heard the story of uh, ignace semmelweis who actually found that uh, some of his students went from autopsies straight to deliveries right and they had a lot of cases of patients having uh, fever after deliveries which is which we call puerperal sepsis or uh, puerperal fever uh, essentially so he came up with this theory that there's something that they are carrying from the autopsies to the delivery and at that time nobody knew the germ theory and you know louis pasteur and all of that happened much later so he came up with the idea of why don't you just you know wash your hands and they used to use a chlorine based powder and the results were remarkable but it still took 50 years and I, you know i know some of you administrators will, will still complain that i have issues with hand hygiene people don't wash hands enough or use sanitizers but fortunately with covid that has changed a bit but still that is yet to come into practice full time you know the idea of hand hygiene per se and then in in the recent times you've seen things like helicobacter pylori causing you know gastric ulcers and it took about 15 or 20 years so dr gillam actually predicted back in 2009 that by the time we reach to 2025 we'll reach something called the healthcare singularity meaning that the time between research and practice will practically be zero right and that my friends i think in some way with covid and specifically covid vaccines we've actually broken several barriers uh, to come up with you know excellent uh, research output which has been translated into practice in in the shortest period possible Uh, so in some sense i think that we've reached the healthcare singularity a little ahead of time in terms of drugs and and vaccines as such so the question is uh, was artificial intelligence the linchpin of of the covid-19 pandemic response and i know that we've not done very well but what i wanted to show you is is the future state and between where we are and where we can be lies all of the work ahead and how we can actually you know translate our actions into meaningful outcomes right so you look at artificial intelligence and how that has helped in the whole idea of uh, the covid pandemic response so the first thing is uh, predictive models uh, and i know all of us have failed miserably on on predictive modeling right uh, nobody predicted the second wave nobody predicted that we would have a mucor mycosis um, outbreak nobody predicted that we would uh, have such severe oxygen shortages or even simple things like beds for example how many ventilated beds we need so i think the overall idea of predictive modeling has you know has a lot of room for improvement and uh, there are ways obviously from an ai perspective we talk about stochastic modeling and you know uh, linear regression methods it's, i'm not going to going to get into the details of of the ai per se but just the applications and how we need to use them more meaningfully the second aspect is that of 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 diagnosis right and and you would have heard of several people um we are talking about medical in, image interpretation how ai is able to do uh, ct scan images and and learn from that and give you an automated diagnosis of what is a you know uh, what is a covid uh, uh, 
uh, diagnosis and what isn't, right? And uh, in that, unfortunately, what has happened is majority of the AI workforce has been focusing on the whole idea of image analytics and the, 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 the focus on diagnosis and treatment otherwise has been very low. So in the AI world, medical image interpretation is the low hanging fruit. Uh, because in AI, you need what are called training data sets. So you have an algorithm and you tell them that this is what a ground glass opacification looks like. And you, you know, torture that algorithm with data until it starts to tell you what, what an actual test image is like and whether that's a ground glass opacification indeed. So that was the low hanging fruit. And I think everybody, you know, started rushing in that direction. And unfortunately, what happens is, uh, you know, there's also a sense of a profit motive. Uh, so without the oversight, looking at the whole ecosystem of technology and how we need to invest efforts in meaningfully, uh, if you let the system run, it, it basically tries to find the easiest uh, route out, right? Just like water. And that's what has happened with uh, diagnosis. And um, unfortunately, pre-test pre diagnostics, like, you know, things like looking at a cough, uh, you know, app, I, and, and I know Dr. Vishal Rao worked on a similar app, which was published earlier, that you can actually diagnose uh, uh, COVID through the, the coughing patterns, essentially. But we didn't have that kind of, uh, you know, entree into the, the whole idea of diagnosis through the application of AI, unfortunately. And then if you look at the treatment part, this is where I think the idea of intelligence augmentation, as opposed to artificial intelligence, right, AI versus IA, that has made its mark. So the, the, the whole doubling time that I spoke of, 20 days and the articles doubling every 20 days, I think what AI has been able to do is synthesize that evidence through something we call natural language processing, NLP, and uh, named entity recognition, you know, is a, is a technique that you actually identify concepts and say, this drug works for so-and-so and it was published in so-and-so paper. And that's what has uh, been, you know, at the heart of providing actionable insights from all of the published literature. I think AI has done extremely well in that, uh, that whole area. And uh, the idea of, uh, you know, the whole vaccine and drug discovery process. Um, the, uh, so there's a, a company called DeepMind, uh, which is part of Google now. And they came up with something called the alpha fold, uh, you know, it, it's, it's essentially a protein, predict, a protein folding predictive algorithm and essentially works in uh, looking at how proteins will respond to certain, certain compounds. And I think they, that uh, aspect has worked very well uh, for, uh, you know, some, some element of predictive modeling. But then from there, you need to take those elements and put them into uh, research studies, right? Clinical studies, which is again, like a long drawn process as such. But some of the, you know, you would have heard of a drug called barcitinib, and that was uh, created by a company called Benevolent AI in the UK. And uh, that drug is otherwise used for rheumatoid arthritis. And this is what we call drug repurposing. Take an existing drug, see how it works with others and see whether it would be effective in COVID. So we've done that well as well. But, you know, the whole idea here is that uh, AI has been successful where it is assisting and augmenting intelligence, but not replacing intelligence, right? And doctors have this fear of AI saying that, you know, AI is going to replace me very soon and, and things of that sort. And, and why I would ask them not to be anxious is because AI is yet to get to that level of general intelligence, you know, having that self-awareness. Uh, we are still a, a, a lot of distance away from that. And I think that's where uh, utilizing artificial intelligence to, you know, empower and augment and essentially unburden clinicians is where, you know, the sweet spot lies. But then the other part is also how AI can behave unpredictably. So I was talking about NLP and named entity recognition, right? So in the earlier days, uh, and now NLP has come a long way, when somebody used to translate this, uh, you would have heard of people saying, right, out of sight is out of mind. And uh, that's a, you know, like a, a idiom in English. Uh, so when somebody put that through a, an NLP engine, it said out of sight, out of mind is equal to invisible idiot, right? So it is taking the context of out of sight, meaning invisible and out of mind is idiot without understanding the context of it. But obviously that we've come a, a long way from there and NLP has now certainly done very well. The other part is how 
AI can behave unpredictably and that could be borderline dangerous as well. So there was this one study done in Stanford by Andre Esteva um, where they were actually classifying dermatological cancers and they started to see that the algorithm was doing extremely well in identifying malignant cancers. Um, so you see AI is mostly a black box. You don't know how it is coming to that recommendation, but then people figured out that it was able to do that and it has uh, it was actually focusing a lot on images which had a scale on the side you see that scale on the side which is usually look uh, you know you put that in the picture to look at you know the size of the lesion but uh, the the algorithm figured out that if there is a scale in all likelihood that is a malignant lesion so you see a high, it's not focusing on the lesion but an associated element that one could have not thought of but ai is capable of doing that and then there's this example, right? So there's a game called Coast Runner, and the objective is to actually reach uh, the final, uh, you know, the finishing line. And uh, people used to think that, you know, you could uh, finish and get high points, right? But there's an algorithm called uh, reinforcement learning, and the you give the the algorithm a reward, and the reward here is the number of points. So what the the algorithm figured out is that if you go into this loop and have this and go the wrong way, although you may crash and burn, but still you keep going back. And by that time, those three things that you see, they reload and you can keep getting points. And the objective was to gain more points, right? So it kept going on in an infinite loop round and round over again. So that's again, something that uh, AI can do. So it, it can be a little dangerous. And I know of people like uh, Professor Hawking and Elon Musk, who you know kind of warn against the, the dangers of you know, depending too much on AI. But as far as healthcare is concerned, how, how can we make AI more safe, more meaningful? And if, if you folks, uh, you know, have read uh, Isaac Asimov uh, and, and the foundation series, he came out with the three laws of robotics uh, way back in the 50s and the 60s, right? Which apply and, and make so much sense for AI today as well. So the number one rule is that a robot cannot injure a human, right? Uh, through action or inaction. Number two is that the robot should obey human orders unless it is in contravention to rule number one. And number three is that the robot should protect itself unless it is in contravention of one and two. So if you put in such, such simple laws and make that part of every algorithm and script that you write, see, and at the end of the day, all AI is written by humans and then it gets a mind of its own. But if you have certain fail-safe rules fundamentally as part of the algorithms, you'll make sure that these things don't occur in the future. And this is so this is just a very simple uh, brief overview of what uh, artificial intelligence and specifically hc ai which is human centered right so on the one hand i've spoken of uh, a black box ai you don't know what's happening inside you give it a training data set and you ask it a certain question and it will give you outputs but you don't know how it is coming out with that recommendation right at the other end and this is what i'm a big proponent of is what is explainable ai that you know what is actually happening, which I like to call the glass box AI, that you can actually see what is happening. But more importantly, the idea of human-centered AI is that there is a continuous figure of eight learning loop, right? You know, like the infinity symbol, that the human drives what is happening in the in the black box, and and you know this, this keeps getting fine-tuned with human input. So you cannot leave uh, the algorithm to decide everything on its own, and that's where I think explainable AI has a big role to play in AI. Uh, but for me, I think the idea of human-centered, like we saw with Patch Adams, is the idea of uh, you know also being patient-centric, having that level of empathy. Because at the end of the day, when you when you look at, you know, even I'm taking an example of oncology, and you've had so many, and we've spoken of the, the, the issues with how drugs uh, take so long to get into phase three trials, but there are so many, you know, applications as such. And if you look at this idea here, like looking at internet of things and how you can analyze this data and use uh, machine learning models on it on things like how people are stepping every day postural changes and then visualize that and put it back into the loop with patients you can actually run things like remote clinical trials and uh, we, we've spoken of ho uh, home healthcare uh, and one level further is actually doing remote trials right you know monitoring patients separately and then the whole idea of even uh, you know the the uh, data that uh, gener is generated through genomic sequencing 
and clinical trials obviously that are not able to keep up with that uh, you know that kind of uh, progression in the field of molecular uh, sciences in in oncology specifically and that's where i think real world data has a has a big role to play but overall the idea is that you know with with uh, with ai per se we need to start looking at things which are ingrained in the whole idea of uh, safety you know from from software and this is where you know i'd like to introduce the concept of what we call digital therapeutics and where it's essentially you think of a digital therapy like any medication right a doctor will write to you um, say a, a tablet of uh, doxycycline right he is giving you a prescription so he'll give you a prescription for an app itself so it's not like an app is is you know somebody just builds it and starts testing it without you know clinicians having an oversight of it and that's where i think using digital applications and looking at them like therapeutics is critical because that you know helps in preventing managing and treating a disorder or a disease and then you ensure that these are the foundational principles that you have best practices in design and a bunch of other requirements which you know the digital therapeutics alliance has come up with but what i want to focus your attention on is the last two requirements right is publishing trial results in in, in clinically meaningful outcomes in peer reviewed journals and uh, also clearing yourself through uh, regulatory bodies and certifying yourself uh, to something called SAMD that is a software as a medical device and for you administrators here yeah, this is critical to know because the cdsco the drug controller general of india has started to look at all of digital health which is used in treating patients as a medical device so like you need to have fda clearance or uh, you know dcgi approval for a medical device same thing applies for software too and there is a whole validity process going from scientific clinical analytical and clinical performance validity is that you know you need to actually uh, incorporate in the whole process so all people who are looking at you know starting a company and building an app think of it as a digital therapeutic like tomorrow will the doctor prescribe this application or this solution that you're building and i think that's also at the core of artificial intelligence and uh, you know the whole idea behind this thing is that it is it is bound to make care safer right all of ai and and digital health applications need to first look at the first rule uh, you know in terms of looking at outcomes the first part is that do no harm i mean that's the first rule of of medicine that you can't do harm to patients you may not be able to treat the disease but don't do additional harm right the second is that you follow best practices what what is out there what is the latest and how do you come up to speed with the evolving nature of medicine itself and finally we've spoken of un, uh, spoken of unburdening clinicians you know taking all of the heavy lifting and giving them time to focus on you know specific things and i call them the four e's right empathy ethics excellence and equity I, i'm telling you for now you know it's it's pretty sure that it would take uh, decades for artificial intelligence to be empathetic and we talk about empathetic ai and having self aware ai and things of that sort so ai may become very advanced as such but for it to uh, you know gain empathy it will take you may have seen seen the movie by centennial man another movie from robin williams he takes about 2 2 300 years to become uh, you know actually human and and actually start crying uh, at the sight of a uh, loved one dying right so ai has got a long way to go there and that's where i think the whole idea of of humans filling that so i want to show you the you know the future state now if if 20 years later we have a disease called covid 39 and the age of technological singularity where uh you know ai intelligence has actually surpassed human intelligence how would this work so you 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 see the moment somebody say if the first paper is published immediately that is actually you know you've got things like uh, uh transfer learning zero shot learning and it is transmitted to icus all across the world and you've got how it looks on a ct scan for example and that image is you know again built into the whole system and and you've got uh, clinicians understanding how this is happening but more importantly it's the real time epidemiological surveys and mapping of cases and how they are moving from one place to the other managing you know international borders and travel across borders and then having drones supplying 
you know testing kits and things of that sort and you know having this whole ecosystem what we call the internet of things everything is connected and you've got all these results and not you know manually reporting how many test cases are positive and how many mortalities have uh, you know occurred which we know is is under reporting all of that is uh, you know is automated and we are able to do uh, machine learning based on all of the you know evidence that's coming through on a daily basis and the quarantine protocols are again managed on a real time uh, you know basis with the use of uh, gis and things of that so so technology is available the idea is you know applying that and then if in covid 39 they would have managed to you know manage this disease and this outbreak within say 15 or 20 cases and probably of one death or so and in that time, you know, if they look back at COVID-19, COVID-19 would be a, a major case study, meaning how did humanity go wrong in managing a pandemic, which could have easily, you know, been managed so early and, and uh, you know, avoided so much widespread mortality and morbidity as such. But at the end of the day, even then, one thing will be sure is that technology will still need to unburden doctors so that they are able, doctors, nurses, and all the entire care team uh, because I think even the future uh, for healthcare looks more like this to me, where doctors are spending time with patients, being empathetic and, you know, providing all the level of excellence in terms of care, uh, rather than focusing on mundane things, which I think the AI can, and can take up and essentially do the heavy lifting so that we do what we are best at, which is uh, treating patients with compassion and empathy. So that's, that's what I had to share with you. Happy to take any questions. Sure, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ujwal, for uh, enlightening on us uh, yay presentation. I hope, I think, uh, one end, I think we need beds in the tier two and tier three cities, and we are talking about yay in the other end. And need to move from preventive medicine to predictive medicine. That is what I think the need of the hour. That is what we understand out of this AIA as well as for other infrastructure deficit and all those things. Hope I think uh, we will be in a position to have a detailed discussion uh, after the question and answer session. Now I request uh, Mr. Ashok Tyagarajan to take over. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. KK. And uh, Dr. Ujwal, uh, you have taken us to the different world. And I could see a lot of similarities between my erstwhile colleague, uh, Dr. Vishal Rao and yourself. Both talk on technology and science, which is very close to my heart. And, and great, great things. And I, I think we need one 24 hours with you to learn. Fantastic. And uh, it's nice. Uh, and it's really, really, really fantastic. And you have opened the minds really good. Thank you very much, uh, doctor, for your wonderful time and the best presentation. I, I can say that. And uh, I would like to now I have a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, my guru, uh, Bhishma Pidamaha of uh, Hospital Administration, Mr. UK Ananda Padmanabhan. And I always, in all forums, I say today, uh, Ashok Tyagarajan is here as a hospital administrator is only because of this great man who took my hand and who hand, her, right. it was right. a hand holding. He taught me what is hospital administration. And, and still I wonder, whenever I talk to him, he's like a treasure. I, I learn new things. And uh, somebody who has got 42 years of hospital administration and uh, he has been uh, traveling from, he was the, he joined with the Apollo Hospital the first hospital administrator who was an engineer and uh, who was with the corporate and who was with a semi-corporate multinational conglomerates. And he also worked in small cities like Madurai where he was having an assignment with the uh, uh, Minakshi Mission Hospital and also in, uh, uh, in Kaveri Hospital as a group COO. And uh, he's a great orator and a great engineer. And it's always a pleasure and always uh, I get goosebumps when I see his presentation, how this gentleman is able to get newer, newer things. And maybe with some people like Dr. Gyani and Dr. and Mr. Ananda Padmanabhan, uh, they get uh, shiner and finer uh, when the age advances. It's really great. And over to our beloved uh, Mr. UK Ananda Padmanabhan, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Ashok. Uh, you have been very generous as usual in introducing me and uh, thanks uh, Krishna for inviting me to this. Uh, sir, your voice is not audible, sir. Yeah. Are you able to hear me now? Are you a able little, to hear? A little more, sir. Hello? Now it's okay. Yes, now it's yes okay. sir. Now, yes. Yeah. Uh, are you able to hear me now clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, one second. One second. Let me... Uh, 
okay then thank you uh, ashok uh, uh, for introducing me uh, so generously uh, today as usual and uh, thank you krishna for inviting me and uh, i am privileged to be a part of a stellar panel with uh, dr giridhar gyani our quality guru epitome of knowledge and humility epitome of knowledge and humility and uh, i have been having the privilege of uh, interacting with him for over almost 20 years and today i am also happy to be with uh, uh, dr ujjwal rao and uh, my colleagues like krishnanand uh, subhasurya neelakannan and everybody here and um, before i just move on to my presentation uh, there are a few uh, comments which i wanted to make with regard to ai in healthcare i remember i read somewhere that uh, in in course of time uh, the doctors will not be replaced by ai but uh, doctors who don't know ai will be replaced so that is the comment i heard and one day i heard uh, dr Shev devishetty saying that in course of time maybe in another say 5 years time the insurance companies will insist the hospitals to have a second opinion from a ai doctor that uh, those are the two things which i heard uh, and uh, usually people like ashok and krishna and many people brand me as a technology person they think that i don't know anything other than technology in the hospital and um, and they also feel that i am uh, as notorious as anybody else to talk for long in such uh, meetings but uh, i know that the time is limited so i just have about 10 to 15 minutes to talk about the subject which i have chosen so today what i thought was i will focus on Uh, some of the specific lessons we learned out of this covid-19 as administrator and for a change i am also going to move out of technology and then talk about uh, some operational issues which we faced and which we will continue to face in the future so before uh, going to those two cases i thought i will take uh, two practical cases uh, or the areas which we have been encountering i am sure which we will see that in the future too one is the oxygen management in the country and also oxygen management in the hospitals and second is the impact health insurance had um, on uh, 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 on the covid situation so these are two things which i thought i will quickly discuss so before we go into those two areas i thought i should uh, just take a brief uh, note on what has happened uh, during the covid 19 situation as all of us know that covid 19 was unprecedented it was a tsunami and i don't know it was a monster and we all know as dr giridhar gyani uh, was saying that it destroyed many many lives and livelihood please understand the many families were uh, destroyed uh, father and mother died but the daughter was alive the maybe uh, maybe the father and mother were alive the son died so so many things happened that way similarly uh, we also ch saw the change the way we work and we live in the uh, in this community you know the, the factories are going to change the hospitals are going to change the way they are going to work and way we are going to live in fact i found uh, in one of the uh, posts that you know it seems in uh, uh, in mysore they have put a notice in the house that please don't come to our house and we will also not come to your house that is the notification they had put in their uh, houses and then the medical infrastructure is crumbling under pressure and uh, it is because you know it was ill planned poorly funded and managed and it was very fragile and vulnerable in the infrastructure for the past 70 years and one thing that happened as everybody was saying the patient load increased from 100% to 700% so i think that is what happened uh, having said that i think we we must also know what is the social societal responsibility now as ashok was saying even now cases are increasing in astronomical proportions it is not in the linear proportion it is not in the exponential proportion we are talking about where we had only 70 cases we are talking about 700 and 800 cases coming into the hospital then now in this situation no amount of beds no amount of ventilators no amount of oxygen equipment or other equipments will help so i am sure government the ngos and medical professionals are doing a wonderful job but i think we have a societal responsibility and only way we can fight this covid my in my opinion is by the societal responsibility of masking social distancing hand 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 hygiene 
good food, good exercise, vaccination, positive attitude. I think these are all the things that will help us to win over this COVID-19 situation. So let me just take only two cases. Uh, let us talk about uh, medical oxygen supply in the country and in the hospital, how we manage and how we need to manage in the future. Uh, maybe we need to uh, know some basics of uh, medical oxygen. So when we talk about the basics of medical oxygen and it is, it is as good as a drug, I don't know whether it is really classified as a drug, but it is as good as a drug because it goes into the patient. Uh, and it must be 99.9% 99 .9 pure. But right now we have changed the industrial um, industrial oxygen into medical oxygen. I'm sure there will be some issues with it. Then when we are talking about using oxygen in the hospital, we are talking about A-type oxygen, B-type oxygen, and D-type oxygen uh, type cylinders, where A-type is used in the operation theaters, B-type is used in the wards, and D-type is used in the, the manifold rooms now as a standby. We also have in the last say five or 10 years, we have the liquid medical oxygen, which comes in containers, which is in the news, uh, in the media now, uh, because of this uh, lack of LMO and the transportation. Then we have oxygen concentrators and oxygen generators. You must understand oxygen concentrators are different from oxygen generators. Now uh, people are using oxygen concentrated in house when you require only five liters of oxygen, but now, the government and maybe many of the um, hospitals are trying to uh, put up uh, oxygen generators in the hospital. But of course, uh, there are so many issues to be addressed when we are putting this oxygen generators, which will produce about 120 gas cylinders every day, depending upon the size of the oxygen generator, which they are going to put up. But these oxygen generators, I understand, are quite expensive. And uh, they are also going to be uh, uh, difficult in terms of managing the, um, the generators because it is something like uh, managing a diesel generator. You need to have a uh, technician who is 24 bar seven and we should ensure the quality of oxygen that comes out is also taken care of and you need to keep changing the sleeves um, every now and then. Then in this, now what is also happening is that industrial oxygen plants are now converted into medical oxygen and medical oxygen versus industrial oxygen, no real study has been done till now. And uh, of course, uh, now let us talk about the oxygen management at the national level and at the service provider level. What happened at the national level is that there was a lack of production capacity in the country. You know, every state was uh, requiring about 500 tons, 700 tons of uh, metric tons of uh, gas, but um, we didn't have that kind of a capacity. Maybe we had companies like Proxy Air, you know, we had some companies like Inox producing uh, in uh, different uh, states and they were transporting uh, the liquid medical oxygen, but was not that was not good enough. Cannot blame the government hospitals because the consumption was astronomically going up by seven times. And uh, then another problem we had is, although we were able to produce oxygen, we did not have enough liquid oxygen containers uh, to be transporting that uh, liquid oxygen. And even uh, gas cylinders, uh, gas uh, filled up cylinders were also not available. So we had to import containers from other countries, even by air and ship. The military did a great job in transporting them. And then we had to transport uh, even these uh, uh, containers, you know, through uh, trains and uh, maybe we are going to uh, transport them by ship. The government gave a lot of incentive for producing oxygen, uh, like subsidy in, for producing, uh, having uh, oxygen generators in the hospital. I understand that the government of Tamil Nadu is going to give about 20 to 30 percent. There is some, uh, you know, circular circulating in the WhatsApp, but we must see when it really becomes a reality. But definitely government is having an intent to incentivize oxygen uh, generators in the hospital. And it has also directed the, you know, the industries like uh, Vedanta, like the Salem steel plant. Uh, they have some oxygen producing capacity and they're trying to divert that oxygen producing capacity uh, into, uh, uh, into medical oxygen. But the problem is uh, when they try to uh, convert these industrial oxygen into medical oxygen, I am little concerned about the quality of oxygen that they can produce. You know, even companies, multinational companies like Inox and Proxy Air, uh, sometimes we have a problem of quality of oxygen and the quality of the cylinders they use. But in this kind of troubled situation, when you try to, you know, double click the, the process of uh, producing oxygen through this industrial, uh, converting the industrial oxygen into medical oxygen, whether we land up into uh, some quality problem which I don't know very indirectly or directly is connected to some 
uh, black fungus and things like that. We, we don't want to comment on that. But uh, having said that, uh, the, what, what is at the hospital level? What happened at the hospital level? It's okay at the national level, uh, we got an insight, but uh, I have been an administrator uh, like many of you, and I'm sure people like Krishnanand and Krishna and Ashok would have seen this in the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, I must say that the medical oxygen supply system in the hospital is not given the due place. They did not understand the importance of this until COVID-19 struck us. So you find that uh, in now uh, in some of the hospitals where in our hospital, when we had only 70 uh, D-type cylinders consumption, now it has become 700 cylinders per day. We were struggling, but thanks that we had this liquid oxygen plant as well as the uh, oxygen manifold where we could use the both of them together, it was fine. Uh, but the, the oxygen consumption went up so much in every hospital, be it a small nursing home or a 100 bedder hospital or a 500 bedder hospital, oxygen consumption rose to peak and it was very, very difficult to manage. But uh, having said that, I think we did not plan even the existing uh, uh, oxygen pipeline system very well. In many of the hospitals, uh, we found that uh, during at the time of planning the, uh, the, the uh, pipeline, uh, medical oxygen pipeline system, there was an issue. In the science, many people put up their manifold room in the basement. That is why when the floods came in some hospitals in Chennai, you know, the whole manifold room was flooded. The oxygen, uh, um, the tanker could not go to the manifold room and deliver oxygen. All that happened. And sometimes they even uh, put it near the electrical substation and transformer, which again was bad. Then they were also trying to, trying to put it inside the buildings. It is also bad because, you know, they are all compressed cylinders. And if there is an explosion, it could cause great damage to the hospital. So I think it is very, very important going forward. You know, the requirement of oxygen will be more. You need to plan these uh, oxygen pipelines better. And one more thing that happened was that uh, when they were designing the, the oxygen pipelines, the oxygen pipelines are copper pipelines and they have to be sized properly. You know, previously we used to have only five liters of uh, oxygen required for any room or maybe when it goes to ICU, maybe it was 15 liters per, uh, uh, per patient and things like that. But only thing is once the, uh, once the COVID patients came in, the requirement uh, shot up so huge that the, op the present oxygen pipelines could not take up the load. And I am sure now everybody is struggling. And one more thing that happened is that once they, previously when they designed the manifold rooms, in the manifold rooms also they didn't design the regulators, design the pipelines, design the cylinders to the requirement of the, the present requirement of about five times increase or seven times increase. So the manifold rooms are also becoming a bottleneck. So you need to be very careful when you're planning the manifold rooms, the lines in the manifold rooms, the regulator in the manifold rooms, and also the oxygen pipelines that go into the, uh, the patient areas. And one thing which I felt was uh, that uh, like we have energy meters, like we have energy meters, like we have water supply, water meters, we should also have oxygen meet supply meters in the lines. So we simply buy LMO from some company and then pump it into our storage tank and then pump that gas out we only charge the patient that you, uh, you are charged for one day, you are charged for two days. And uh, we, there is no transparency in the way we deliver oxygen, the quantum of oxygen we delivered, how much is that we are purchasing. And I think if we can have a uh, oxygen measuring meter, a digital oxygen measuring meter in every distribution line so that we can track it uh, remotely like they do, like they do in Kerala. Can you believe today the Kerala has got a uh, war room where they monitor the oxygen supplies that are made to different hospitals, they are, they are, where the oxygen is coming, where the oxygen is going, how it is being used, all that is being monitored at the, at the district level, at the state level in a war room. When that is the case, why we cannot do the monitoring of the oxygen supply? Because we get about 12 KL, 13 KL, 15 KL every day. So we should be able to monitor the supply of oxygen like we do this, uh, monitor the supply of electricity or water. And so, and one more thing that the problem we had apparently was that the copper pipelines that were used were not certified in many hospitals. We are supposed to have a uh, certification, Lloyd certification for the uh, copper pipes. We don't know uh, whether these copper pipes are certified and if they got some certificates, whether there are genuine certificates. 
So I think it is also very important to see all this at this stage. But another interesting thing that happened uh, in all our hospitals is, and maybe I was also a party to it when I was in Kauai Medical Center, but I think that's, uh, that was mitigated when I came to the MGM hospital in Kauai Medical Center or Kaveri Medical Center, or even for that matter in Hospital Hospital at that time, we were not providing oxygen outlet for every bed. We were providing oxygen outlet for every ICU bed. We were providing oxygen outlet for some special rooms, but we never provided oxygen outlet for every bed in the hospital, whether it is a C-type bed or a, or a general ward bed. But at best we did was we provided one oxygen outlet in a six bedded uh, general ward if there was a requirement, we used to move the patient to that oxygen outlet bed. So, but now going forward, I think it will become very imperative that we, pro we make it as a part of the infrastructure that every bed should have an oxygen pipeline. The same thing happened when we started the pneumatic tube system way back in uh, 2010. And everybody said, no, no, it is not required. You know, it, is, it doesn't serve a purpose and things like that. But after about three or four years, when we implemented in a COVID medical center, then every hospital started implementing it. And today it has become a part of the infrastructure, hospital infrastructure. Every hospital is putting up the pneumatic tube line system. In the same way, I think we should start putting up the oxygen pipelines for every bed. Uh, see, these were all the operational challenges now. The operational challenges were now the rising cost of oxygen. And everybody complained that you know uh, the oxygen charges is becoming one substantial portion of the COVID-19 patient bills. Very true because when we were purchasing oxygen in the normal times, it was about uh, rupees 11 per cubic meter. Now it has gone up to 20. Even if you pay that, you're not getting that uh, oxygen. You have to buy it in black market. So there is definitely an operational challenge. And another operational challenge is the leakage and wastage of oxygen at user end. And you know what is happening? Many of these uh, maintenance guys, uh, the technicians, they are not taking care of the oxygen pipelines and the flow meters properly. So they just don't check on a regular basis, which they are expected to check, but there is a permanent leak of oxygen that happens without their knowledge. So that if you get say 10 kL of what, uh, 10 kL of uh, medical oxygen, for all you know, you may, must have lost about 0.25 kL by without your knowledge you have been wasting in the pipeline. So there must be a mechanism to check that such leakages don't happen. And one more area where uh, maybe a place where the leakage happens is the nurses uh, and technicians put oxygen mask on the patient. They also use tubings. And once the patient is weaned out of oxygen, they just uh, remove the mask, but if they forget to close the, the flow meter or the oxygen supply and oxygen keeps on flowing. Like there is a wastage of water in our overhead tank. So I think it is also very important. There must be a, a conscious attempt by the nurses, by the technician to manage this oxygen uh, supply very, very carefully because it is a very precious commodity. And we also have a problem of lack of manpower to manage these oxygen ventilators and all that. Now we are talking about ECMO machines. We are talking about sophisticated ventilators which use oxygen. So I think these technicians must be told how to use concentrator, how to use uh, uh, cylinder oxygen, how to use uh, ventilators, how to use ECMO machines using this oxygen. oxygen. And I, that's what, as I told you, in course of time, uh, maybe we will have... Uh, uh, the oxygen monitors uh, in the pipeline itself. So we should be able to build the patient based on the oxygen that is consumed coming out of this data. And uh, finally, finally, I don't, I, I'm no doctor, no stalwart like uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gridhar Gani. Even he did not uh, commit on the black fungus. He only make a reference to it. But as an engineer, as an administrator, I have a feeling that somewhere the administrator is also causing uh, ca causing this black, uh, maybe responsible for this black fungus infection. Because if I don't give you a quality, if I don't give you quality oxygen, if I don't give you quality cylinder, if I don't give you a quality tubing, and if I don't maintain hygiene conditions in the flow meter, whether I will be accept accelerating the uh, the black fungus uh, because uh, they have, they were already on steroids and whether uh, this one and uh, the steroids together cause that uh, black fungus problem, it is a million dollar question to be answered by the technicians. Quickly, uh, I, another important uh, topic I thought I will talk about is about health insurance. As you know that health insurance is a social concept. It is a number game. And uh, the, once you expand the, the base of the insurance, then, then the more and more people can get benefited. For example, I have been paying 
uh, insurance premium for the past 25 years and maybe god was kind that we didn't use that uh, uh, medical insurance for any inpatient treatment but i am i would have paid about maybe about 2.5 lakhs till now and i am sure that money would have been used to some patient in tirupura or maybe in meghalaya some patient would have got benefited out of it and in fact uh, i have even made it a practice to donate insurance premium believe me i pay about 5 up to a five of the poor children or maybe five of my poor people friends and relatives i pay insurance premium for them and instead of paying some money for their medical treatment i thought we should develop the culture of paying insurance premium so i am trying to pay and if all of us can also do that it could be a it will be a chain so i with all that you find only 50% of the people in the country are insured and uh, i feel that as a administrator as a person who has been in the senior leadership for a long time i feel health insurance is a great funding mechanism if a lot of all the people in the country 130 crores of people in the country whether through private insurance or government insurance get in, uh, paid pay insurance premium there will be a lot of money in the kitty and so uh, a lot of patients can be treated in the hospital the hospitals will get money once the hospitals get money they will invest invest in the infrastructure so hospitals will grow and another interesting thing about uh, health insurance that it is a regulatory mechanism in fact we saw that in the covid situation and you know there was so much of uh, hue and cry that some hospitals are charging exorbitantly and there was a trust deficit in fact there was a trust deficit uh, about the hospital that they were charging extensively but the government is regulating i am sure insurance with this covid 19 insurance can also be a regulatory authority so i think uh, this will also play a very important role as a, a regulatory mechanism in terms of tariff and um, the, I, and and i feel that uh, the hospitals uh, can uh, can also not complain about uh, you know the escalation cost in um, consumables and equipment and manpower once this comes last but not the least i want to talk about this insure tech uh, as you know i am a great uh, fan of uh, technology and um, i always feel that uh, everything in the hospital uh, can be managed to a large extent uh, with technology and we can leave out the uh, mundane tasks to this uh, ma- mundane tasks uh, to this technology and then uh, like uh, usual was showing that the doctors can spend lot of that time with the children emotionally connecting with them and things like that so i feel that in course of time in course of time the hyper automation i am talking about a term called hyper automation will come into the hospital on which i am working you know in fact i am trying to develop a, a hyper automation platform in the hospital and uh, this platform is a software platform this platform can connect all equipments can connect all uh, uh, all these uh, third party softwares like a hospital information system fax maybe lis uh, it can connect all those third party um, uh, uh, softwares it can connect iot devices it can connect sensors it can also directly allow the users to input data so this software uh, this uh, platform will be a single sign on platform even some ai applications can run on it so once they become a single sign on platform i uh, you will find that we will be able to give access to the insurance companies uh, uh, on the functioning of some of the medical equipment that are happening working in the hospital so if you see a bill if you see a covid 19 bill they will say ventilator charges 30000 rupees and then they will say uh, icu charges uh, they will say uh, 50000 rupees there will be line items like that but there is no way please understand right now we are not able to understand whether those uh, icu charges which they have put for 5 days is really true whether the patients were really in the icu then they would have put operation theater charges about say again 50000 rupees saying that it was for about 5 hours of surgery but we don't know whether they really went to the operation theater whether they stayed in that operation theater for 5 hours whether that particular patient went there we are not able to see but whereas in in this in this new technology platform in the hyper automation technology platform we are going to have iot devices we are going to have iot devices on the patients we are going to have iot devices on the ventilators monitors and these uh, these ventilators monitors will relay real time information to the insurance companies so i i wonder i wonder whether uh, we the insurance companies like star health uh, uh, maybe icici lombard uh, they have about uh, say lakhs of customers 
and and they have uh, say hundreds of hospitals if they can connect live like the kerala government connected with hundreds of hospitals and hundreds of service providers if they can connect to their clients they, they can connect to their hospitals and as soon as a patient gets admitted in the hospital if the insurance companies can get a real time information about uh, that patient that he has been admitted that your insurance patient has been admitted that he has gone to the icu on that particular date he has come out of the icu on a particular date he has gone to the operation theater on a particular day come out on the out on the particular day got discharged and these are all the equipments in which he is he is put on if the insurance company is able to get real time information then the insurance settlement also will become very faster you very can happen in the automobile industry very can happen in the automobile industry why it should not happen in our healthcare industry is my question i am very sure that uh, this technology uh, will really help and uh, uh, if a day of singularity can come in healthcare i think uh, the first step to singularity is this kind of real time collection of information funding the healthcare through this kind of technologies and i wish one day that there is a um, there, i wish one day there is a uh, one uh, we get that day when like in the automobile industry health insurance also industry also is made mandatory one in, now if a car or a lorry comes out of a uh, showroom you must have an insurance but tell me why a baby that is born in a hospital when it is coming out should not have an health insurance and i want to close that uh, close that in that note i think uh, health insurance is going to be a great opportunity uh, to solve a lot of our hospital uh, problems and infrastructure problems and uh, healthcare problems as well thank you ashok and thank you krishna kumar thanks for your for your invitation and thanks for your time thank you very much i am waiting to hear from others as well thank you thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you for your uh, sharing your practical tips i think i really fear administrators without the knowledge of ai may also be replaced in the future that is what i fear so all the administrators yes. i think we should also be in a position to learn ai and all other technologies then only we will be in a position to survive in the market that is what i feel with this note i think uh, let me introduce uh, dr krishnananda he is uh, currently he is the chief operating officer at royal care hospital payamthur dr krishnananda so he is basically a medical graduate then he has turned as an administrator uh, he is currently with seven hundred meter hospital at payamthur dr over to dr krishnananda please uh, share your views Dr. Krishna Nanda, please. Is he on mute? He is. He is online. He is online. No, no. Is he on mute? Mute. No, I don't think so. Let's keep it on mute. Yeah. I think. Uh... sorry he is having some technical issues i think we will uh, hear from uh, dr subha she is a head of nursing services at manipal and uh, let us hear from dr subha good afternoon one and all first of all i would like to thank dr ashok tyagarajan and team for giving me an wonderful opportunity to share the digital platform with my mentors thank you sir thanks a lot before before proceeding to my responsibility i would like to say few words about nursing the world health organization has confirmed in may last year that 2020 would be purely dedicated to the nurses and midwives it chose the theme to coincide with the 200th birth anniversary of florence nightingale that is on may 12 unfortunately the outbreak of covid-19 infection has happened across the world which took the lives of many of the peoples globally as dr girdas nani sir said the role of administrator during this crisis situation is an herculean task as clinical leaders we are supposed to set the equipments we are supposed to design the units and we are supposed to post to the healthcare workers in the field at the same time we are also supposed to provide emotional support to the nursing staff 
who will come across three to four deaths in an hour in a day or in within two hours of time so definitely it was a painful situation to each and every healthcare worker who was working in covid 19 area you can able to imagine the situation where it was like an emotional turmoil so as a nurse administrator how i could able to manage the situation first of all we have just taken the point of pulling the manpower that is staggering the workforce we have divided the nursing staffs into three different categories that is active pool one third is in the active pool one third is in the available pool and one third is in the reserve pool next we have concentrated on upskilling the uh, upskilling the trained nursing personnel through video assisted teaching methods and also on site teaching both the way we have trained the nursing staffs we have also provided with the help of the operational team we could able to provide reliable logistical support especially protection equipments to the healthcare workers as dr jnani sir rightly said multitasking and job rotation that was the main focus for all the healthcare workers we were also strictly adhering to the infection control practices as infection control nurses were posted over there in the covid icus as well as the areas and the main focus was also about syndromic surveillance that is self reporting of the signs and symptoms we just helped them to come out with all these issues and we have also used the line tracing methods to understand the emotional health as well as the physical health of the individuals most importantly we have focused and motivated the nurses during this very difficult time to make a significant positive contribution to fight against the covid-19 pandemic undoubtedly the nurses they have played the integral role nurses in every country they have stepped up and stepped beyond their calling they were working round the clock they were pushing themselves to the limit and putting their lives on the line very often with very limited resources as covid also implies visiting restrictions they were also acting as a liaison officers between the patients patient parties even with the other healthcare team members too so after making all these things also i was really facing few more difficulties that is unprecedented levels of overwork by the nurses so we just focused usually the nurses will be doing three shift duties whereas we just shifted them into four shift duties where they will be given only six hours of work with the ppes and also we were concentrating on the occupational health and safety of the workers we have made all the healthcare professionals they are well trained with proper using of ppes either wearing ppe or removing the ppes self monitoring protocols even if they develop with any symptoms they definitely they will be reporting to the concern apart from that we have also dedicated healthcare professionals to work in the covid-19 areas and additional holistic support with the help of the psychology and psychiatric department we have also given all the holistic support especially concentrated on the mental health parenting support meals and non punitive sick policies they could mitigate stress and help to prevent the burnout as sir has rightly said building resilience it played a major role sir apart from all these things we have also initiated 24 hours of covid helpline for the healthcare workers so that we could able to definitely meet the challenge and behind every staff nurse there is a supervisor and there is an administrator so we set our standards and we set as an examples we were also remaining visible in the covid areas we have made supervisors they were they must make their presence felt and they were also help in building the relationship with the nurses and it can be a minor or major we were always acknowledging the short term wins it can be patient discharged from the hospital or it can be patient weaned off from the ventilator and shifted to the room here we were always acknowledging the nurses and 
most importantly we can make sure that the nurses voices are heard so it is true the year of covid has overshadowed the year of nurses and midwife still we could able to manage this crisis by all these steps which we could able to make it up however we are always here to care thank you thank you ma'am thank you for uh, sharing your experience over to dr prashananda Dr. Krishnananda. I think he has to unmute. There's some technical issues. You will join now. In the meanwhile, I think uh, I would like to hear from uh, Professor Ashok regarding his, I think, uh, remarks on this event, so that I think uh, we can wind up this event quickly. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar and uh, Subhashuriya. Wonderful uh, presentation, excellent. Uh, I could see the practical aspects, uh, which, uh, as you said, the emotional issues. You know, uh, I have a. Uh, I have my father 91 years, mother is 81 years, and I have a family with a sole uh, earning member. Every day I get a call, how are you? You are in the hospital, are you safe? We are all worried. So one side, you know, the managing the emotional balance and nurses, I always say that, you know, I, I wherever I go, I give importance to nurse and I give respect to them because one side doctors, another side administrators, both they give pressure and the patient. So it's a very tough job. And I always say that uh, nurses, uh, they play a major role. And I still remember uh, Dr. Gyani, when I met him first in uh, somewhere 2010, he showed me a picture. Where are the nurses? He you, nicely, he draws this, you know, these circles, nice circles, elongated circles. He dry, he writes. And then he showed me, Ashok, the, who is close to the patient? Uh, everybody thinks it is doctor. He said, no, nurses. They carry the image of the organization, the patient care, which is uh, given by them. So if you talk about the servitude, uh, as Professor Chandrasekhar always says, uh, they carry the message only from the nurses, and nurses are the important uh, you know, players in the healthcare. Uh, very, very important, and you put it very nicely. And uh, I've been seeing you uh, from your young age, you know, like you have been uh, in the infection prevention department, infection culture nurse in KMCH. You have grown and had the opportunity to work with you in Kim's. It's, it's really great and nice to see that you've grown to the level, you've got a doctorate in nurses. And definitely, as once again, uh, Dr. Gyan used to say, nurses should become an administrators because you know the real nuances of the patient care management and other things. And uh, I think the time has come for the nurses to take the administrator role and uh, start leading from the front. And uh, it's a great opportunity to listen from all these tall wars and the recipients of the healthcare industry and in this time, I think it's a great relaxation and the learning in, in this COVID time, when the hospital is full with the COVID patients and the problems, it's really good relaxing and learning also. And thanks uh, Dr. Kunjumayadeen and Mr. Kishokumar for having arranged. And uh, it's very nice to hear Ashok. from all Ashok. the great people. And it's Ashok. very nice. Ashok. Mr. Krishanan, please. Dr. Krishanan, please. Ah. Dr. Krishnanan, please. I think he's speaking. We are not able to hear the voice. I think uh, we are able to see him, I think. Some connectivity issue, I think. No, but his video is available. Yeah, his video, video is, is available, available, but audio is not coming. Ah, audio is not coming. Is he able to hear us? Yes, very much, sir. Maybe he's asking for one minute. 
maybe two things you have to check your either you are connecting through your microphones or you connected through the computer audio please check those things akshana yeah. are you able to join us Yes. In the meanwhile, I think let me share my inputs also. Yeah. And today, I think we had a wonderful session by Dr. Giridhar Giyani as well as Dr. Ujwal Rao and I, uh, our mentor, uh, Professor Anand Budhnavan also, and all other speakers also. During the talk, I think Dr. Giridhar Giyani has highlighted on us regarding any challenge comes with an opportunity. That is the message which I was able to understand out of his uh, talk. and he has clearly stated that we need more beds in tier 2 and tier 3 cities need to move from patient centric to patient driven that is what i think he has highlighted at in today's talk this really needs to evolve new business models which i was talking for a long time for the last i think all all my mentors and all my gurus i think they may be knowing i was the one i was always advocating for these new business models for the last uh, several locations so this is the right time for us to evolve new business models that new business model should come with a technological innovation that is the need of the hour. that is what i strongly believe the conventional business models anyway i think it is not going to serve the purpose i the, during this covid i think we clearly understood that i think we were not able to take care of the needs of the population in the rural area that is what the biggest challenge which we had as dr giyani has rightly pointed out delhi is having more number of beds chennai is having more number of beds what about pudukote what about theni what about uh, other peripheries so i think this is the real i think challenge definitely i think building up the infrastructure healthcare infrastructure that is a huge task and there is a cost involved into that also but whereas i think the technological innovation as i think dr giridhar giyani has rightly pointed out maybe with a home healthcare or extended care any extended care model that is going to address the needs in the future that is what i understood from dr giridhar giyani stock as dr ujwal rao i think he has really clearly i think pointed out uh, regarding the need of aa or the future of the aa for future hospitals during that talk i think we all i think can understand that we are moving from preventive medicine to predictive medicine that is what i think we all understand so the future is going to be on a predictive medicine and he has concluded his talk with a 4e model that is what i think i would like to comment on it that is empathy ethics excellence and equality so this is what 4e model i think he has recommended so one end i think we are having 5.2 million medical errors the other end the penetration of electronic health health record is very very minimal that is 1% only electronic health records so penetration is there so we need to uh, evolve the strategy wherein we will be in a position to have more penetration of electronic health record almost i think uh, government of india is also taking some initiative on this building up national uh, directory for electronic health record that is what i understand hope i think in the coming days i think that will also be available for us as uh, mr anand padmanavan has clearly highlighted he was talking about doctors as i have stated earlier i am really i think doubtful administrators without ai knowledge administrator without uh, technology he will, they will also be replaced in the near future that is what i, I strongly believe we have learned lot of lessons in covid 1 and covid 2 wave so what are all the measures to be taken from private hospitals as a group as a consortium what are all the measures we have to take that is the i think take home message for this meeting that is what i strongly feel as a healthcare provider i think uh, mr anand padmanavan was clearly explaining regarding the availability of the oxygen plants regarding the availability of the oxygen and distribution of the oxygen all these challenges we had during this covid 1 and covid 2 definitely i think we had all these challenges in place see i am sure with the today's uh, inputs from leaders like dr giyani dr ujwal rao dr anand padmanavan dr subha dr krishnananda and uh, professor ashok tyagarajan with uh, the uh, the administrator's role is much more responsible already hospital administrator role is very complex in nature with this covid i think impact and the looking at the future this hospital administrator role is much more complex in nature and we have much more responsibility to deliver to the institution to deliver to the community that is what i understood from all your uh, inputs as a platform sigam we will continue to uh, initiate 
lot of i think awareness programs as well as to take some educational in, in, in educational initiatives to this forum that is what i think i would like to share at this moment i request all the participants all the leaders to share your inputs on the topics so that we will include those topics in the future for the benefit of the community especially hospital administrator community at the same same time i think that will in turn it will help the our uh, public community public also so we all join together and do something good to the organization at the same time to our nation i think that krishnananda are you able to join us just give me a moment let me let me connect him in phone sir and then therile sir with your permission can we wind up the session okay illa illa sir not 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 no no okay no no problem sir no problem okay okay thank you thank you uh sorry i think he has some technical issues i think he will join us in the next session i believe okay. and uh, any other inputs from any of the uh, leaders any speakers any other inputs you would like to say because running short of time that is the reason we didn't have a question and answer session whom so is having any questions they can mail us we can pass it on to the respective uh, speaker uh, in turn we can get the reply also that is what i would like to share with you oh, i would like to hear from uh, any of the speakers if you want to share anything otherwise i think we can uh, wind up this session dr giani yeah good fantastic you know learning from each other and i think the message has gone loud and clear and uh, and i think thanks to uh, krishna kumar and ashok for organizing this uh, seminar which i am sure number of uh, the viewer must have got benefited from it but the important point is how all of us take the message from each other and see to it that we do not relax now wave 3 may come or may not come i think we must now become alert and take our healthcare services to the greater height from now onward thank you very much thank you sir dr ujwal um, i i think uh, dr gyani ji has said the the real take home message i think that is critical for administrators to uh, you know kind of adhere by i just like to thank all of the luminaries present uh, on uh, in the meeting uh, uh dr uh, uh dr krishna kumar uh dr ashok tyagrajan uh, mr anand padmanabhan who i spoke to at length yesterday and and you know i i had a sense of his technological vision which is uh you know very pleasant to know that uh, you know at at that uh, you know level of seniority people who generally tend to you know brush away technology uh you know it's great that uh, my seniors and mentors are embracing technology and not just people of of my generation as such because i think that's the inevitable truth and uh, it's basically how humans find their place in a technological world i think that's where we are coming to and uh, i think the, uh, the like i just want to reiterate the elements of empathy equity ethics and excellence are things that are very hard to replicate in machines and that's what really you know we stand by and that's what patients need uh, because every patient would need more comfort than actual uh, you know treatment as such at, at uh, such as the time so thanks very much uh, to all the thank, thank you dr ujwal anybody else wants to share anything or else can we wind up the session yeah krishna kumar i just wanted to say a few words okay please can i please sir, yes, sir. Please, yeah, sir. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you krishna kumar and uh, shok for uh, organizing uh, such a wonderful meeting uh, as ever uh, it, it has been always refreshing and knowledgeable to hear uh, people like uh, dr giridhar gani uh, i think uh, he made out a very very uh, relevant points in the sense that what is going to happen in the future uh, how are the healthcare institutions uh, Uh, going to mature are they going to mature uh, in the private direction or it is going to be uh, in the hands of the government uh, but i am still uh, grappling 
uh, which will be the right direction to go. Uh, because we are talking about 130 crore population and our literacy rate is uh, still 20% less. Um, and uh, maybe we have not invested enough on uh, healthcare. Uh, still the politicians and bureaucrats uh, are still not come out of their old mindset. So I am really concerned about my children. I am concerned about my grandchildren. But that doesn't mean that we should be very pessimistic. Uh, but uh, taking from... Um, uh, from what uh, Dr. Ujwal said, I think uh, the day of singularity is going to come. I, I did not know about uh, day of healthcare singularity, but I definitely knew what is the day of singularity because I am a great fan of Elon Musk and Jack Ma and uh, where they, they were telling the day will come when the, uh, the artificial intelligence will overtake uh, the human intelligence. So at that time, for all you know, you may find uh, robots and, uh, and human beings walking together in the roads and maybe the robots will then uh, beat up the human beings. So that is a very scary situation to look at. But uh, you know what is very interesting is uh, yes. as I was listening to a lot of those presentations, somewhere Elon Musk and people like uh, Jack Ma are talking about regulations in AI. That is very, very important. I think uh, like you have regulatory authority for uh, nuclear weapons you have regulatory authority for uh, regulatory authority for biomedical bio uh, biological weapons. I think there must be a regulatory authority, an international regulatory authority for uh, yay, and uh, I'm sure that will happen. Yes. So I think I see uh, Krishna and ready now. I'm able to hear some noise. So I hope uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Krishna and is able to communicate. And we are waiting to hear, sir. Are you able to? Are you? Able to? I, I, I can hear you, sir. Sir, am I audible now? Yeah, you are perfectly yes, audible, sir. Please go ahead. We will listen to you, and then only. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's it's really a pleasure that I have finally been able to connect with you. I don't know. It was a small technical snag. Whatever happened? No, no. Thanks. Believe me, we, we stretched, Ashok, sir. No, and, no. Uh, Krishna, and please believe me that we stretched enough to connect with you. <laughs> That's really nice of you all, and it's, it's, it's indeed an immense pleasure to be amongst this uh, eminent group to have discussed uh, our difficulties during these pandemic times. Please I must say that uh, Corona has done a few good things. It's, it's bringing us all together for a common cause now. And I think uh, the success of the healthcare industry rests with all of us joining together and fighting it out uh, unified. So uh, the first come, uh, I, I think I should indeed thank one and all of you to have given these wonderful inputs. And uh, I would like to, since we are short of time, we'll just uh, share a few of our experiences with you, which have uh, led us, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to see a little bit of success uh, during these difficult times. One is the creation of the COVID task force. And uh, that was done by our chairman and uh, it includes all the people required to deal with the current situation. It includes an eminent group of doctors led by our critical care specialists and our pulmonologist, Dr. Patabiraman, Dr. M. N. Shivakumar. We have a physician. We have our uh, nursing superintendent. We have our uh, uh, medical director. We have our uh, technical uh, engineering team and everybody, the canteen manager. So these people are given their individual responsibilities and they are delegated their tasks to whatever is required to deal with the situation. The second was uh, the vision while creating this hospital. And uh, like uh, Padmanabhan sir was, Ananta Padmanabhan sir was mentioning rightly, we were fortunate enough to have O2 outlets in all the beds we had. So we could escalate fairly quickly. We were able to create a... Uh, completely uh, uh, state-of-the-art six-bedded ICU with uh, uh, monitor connectivity. We have Ica Philips uh, Ica charting solution, and uh, we had the negative pressure beds for uh, I mean, uh, established for every individual bed, so it was safe for the healthcare provider as well as for the patient. In fact, we are proud to say that we we, we had to manage a patient who was COVID neutral initially and left the ICU also COVID neutral by uh, uh, swab, even though the patient was COVID positive by radiology. Uh, we, 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 we are able to escalate uh, reasonably fast and uh, thanks to our technical team who were able to work this from scratch very fast within three weeks time. And like Sir said, we were able to convert our general bed wards to HDU. 
and uh, we had the fortified general ward beds we established uh, a hcu and we were rapidly able to extend the number of beds we in fact expanded from uh, seven bed hcu to almost 21 right now and the remaining general ward beds were also converted to ldu so we were able to rise up uh, you know uh, for the to, uh, to cater to the demands innovation i think is in the blood of a chairman and he probably you know he was one among the first in the country to establish a drive through testing center so most of the cars uh, people who come here for testing were also apprehensive of getting exposed to corona and uh, while doing the covid testing so we established this drive through center and they were able to get them some tested from the privacy of their cars itself and uh, we were able to also have a separate uh, designated area for a fever clinic and we also established a complete emergency wherein we could provide up to the level of uh, uh, hfnc uh, support for the patients so uh, i think we should be immensely thankful to all our uh, support staffs the nursing especially the canteen staff the technical team the it team the medical team and believe me sir and uh, shubha madam that uh, all of us joined together and in fact we, we all of us probably spent a lot of sleepless nights and uh, we we were able to create a setup uh, to to cater to the requirements now in fact uh, we we would say like uh, giritar gyani sir said very rightly we were uh, at one point of time each and every one of us was like an individual commander left to defend the fort with whatever we had and uh, even though the enemy was only one there were also a lot of other difficulties which we had to face before we could conquer the enemy it will be too i mean uh, uh, i mean quick on our side if we say we have conquered no we have not but probably we are braced sufficiently well to deal with the situation right now and uh, uh, very 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 thankful to all of you for having uh, shared your uh, individual inputs and i am really taking home a lot of information which is going to help us face the situation better thank you so much thank you so much and thanks krishna and ashut sir for having organized this thank you dr krishna with with the permission from professor ashok i think can we conclude this meeting yes sir ashok please yeah thank you sir uh, thank you very much and uh, this is uh, once again thank you very much for everyone for having organized i think we should have more such meetings uh, like especially for for nursing and also for uh, ai like that and uh, very nice to see you krishnanand and uh, i think you lost a little bit of your color we you used to be uh, colorful i think covid has uh, put its efforts on you anyway good it's very nice to see you after a long time congratulations for your good work Uh, because Coimbatore is a place where things are happening. That's it. Once again, thank you very much for everyone. It's a great learning. We we'll continue to have uh, this, and I think with this uh, we can conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure. I'm sure. Your support. I think we'll have many more sessions in the coming days. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.